Okay, so uh, we're going to uh, take a look at the French Revolution today. Um, basically, I want to stress the years that brought Napoleon to the peak of his power. Now, there's not going to be an essay on this material. It's, uh, it's more the narrative I want you to be aware of, uh, the story. And there are certain things um, that I'll mention that you should take notes on. Notes on. And um, if you have any questions in class tomorrow, we'll certainly go over those. Um, now, you're going to have a copy of this uh, PowerPoint as well. You'll also have a written um, outline, which you already have in your workbook, so you should be able to follow this pretty easily. And I'll go through the story, and that's what I want you to focus on, and periodically I'll mention things that you should uh, take notes on, things that were not that clear in your notes, for example, or your book. So uh, it's a little bit easier for me to do it today. Um, last time I did this, it was empty room, but now I have an audience, so this will make things a little bit easier, I'm sure. I feel much more comfortable with a, um, a room full of people. So, um, as we get going, um, I want you to pay attention to some material that we've already gone over. Okay, now remember, this, these are essay, possible essay questions that we've gone over in class, and this is just a reminder of things that you should know for the next test. Okay, so I would expect you to know the French Revolution in, in terms of three phases. Um, 1791, 1792, and 1795. So we've gone over this already, the fall of the Legislative Assembly. Okay, and you should be very comfortable with this material already. Fall of the Mountain, 1795. Once again, this is material we've gone over. Okay. And then, of course, the fall of the, the Directory, 1799. So these are possible essay questions on your next test. Okay. Now we're going to do an activity in class tomorrow on why Napoleon's empire fell apart. Um, here he is, 1807, top of his game, he controls all of Europe, and yet um, in a few years he'll be on an island in exile and to die soon after that. So how does it all go wrong? So today's lecture is more or less just showing you how he got to the top of the mountain, shall we say. Okay. Um, Okay, now, where is the exam is when? Uh, well, that's going to be hopefully before vacation, but if not, it'll be the first exam day when we come back. All right? So, okay, let's get down to business. Uh, the rise and fall of the Napoleonic Empire. And just as an FYI before we go any further, this is a neat chart. It shows you the European conflict, 1618 to 1945. And notice it shows you the length of the conflict and the casualties. And you can see what jumps out at you, of course, is the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, can you figure out where the, uh, the Thirty Years' War goes? Also, what's rather interesting is look at the peak in casualties when you get to World War I and World War II. Staggering casualties, notice the wars are much shorter, four years and six years, respectively, for World War I and World War II. Okay, uh, the young Napoleon. Uh, here he's looking at as a young soldier, um, already a general. And remember, he was born in 1769. So that means he was 30 years old when he became a general leading his first army in battle. That's pretty remarkable. And as I said in class before, revolutions usually open up all kinds of opportunities for talent, even if they're not from the nobility. So right now, um, I'm going to go through the coalitions with you. And once again, um, this is stuff that you just read. And um, nothing too important yet. Uh, notice what, a, first of all, we all should all understand what a coalition is. A uh, coalition is another word for an alliance. And um, we should also understand the, the strengths and weaknesses of coalition. Coalition, of course, means an alliance, so it usually means a number of countries. And in all these wars, it's usually Napoleon fighting against the coalition. As he wins, becomes more victorious, he starts to add allies, conquered countries, but basically he's always fighting a coalition. So if their strength is having numbers, the problem with the coalition, of course, is that these are different countries, and very often they don't um, fight as a team. And just like using a sports analogy, if you don't fight as a team, you usually lose. Uh, well, 1792 to 97, notice Napoleon is not in power yet. The French wars in Europe start before Napoleon. He didn't start them. And during this time, you can see, you can read here, he starts to make a name for himself as an artillery officer. And the government first notices him at the siege of Toulon, where he which kind of catapulted him towards power. Um, ask yourself, okay, what government is in power 1792 to 1797? Also, uh, his first military experience will then be 
when he's giving command of the army in Italy. And we just want to remind yourself, looking at this map, you can see Italy hasn't changed much since the Renaissance. Okay. And of course, northern Italy is controlled by Austria. The young general's first Italian campaign, he makes another name for himself at the Battle of Acola, where he leads troops across a bridge under fire and becomes very quickly uh, the hero and the darling of the French. So let's take a look at this first coalition. Um, once again, I want to remind you, uh, I'm not going to put this on a test, nothing you have to memorize right here, but just kind of um, let this seep in in terms of uh, what's going on. Um, notice that the French are victorious, they're controlling Belgium, Holland, the Rhineland, and I put down here the reasons for their success. Okay. If you have any trouble with these, we can bring them up in class. Okay. And one thing I do want you to take note of, that Prussia made peace seating holdings west of the Rhine for compensation elsewhere. And I'm going to come back about that, but as uh, what's going to happen to the Rhineland during these wars. And as Napoleon's being victorious and he's starting to approach Vienna, uh, a peace of Camp Bofomio is signed in 1797. And uh, all these peace treaties, by the way, tend to be just timeouts. So for the countries to re reorganize, refinance, and bring up more troops. Now there's a lull in the fighting here. Napoleon does something rather strange, it would seem. He leaves Europe. In fact, there was some talk for a while. He was so disillusioned with um, what was going on in the government, he even thought of taking the job as a general in Turkey, fighting for the Ottomans. Think how that would have changed history if Napoleon became an Ottoman general and did not fight for the French. It's really hard to imagine what would have happened and how history would be so different. So he takes off for the Egyptian campaign. The rationale for this was that if, the, as you can see here, they wanted to threaten British interest in India and Egypt being close to that would be like a step in that direction. Um, I think he was also kind of taken up with the drama of Egypt, the ancient civilization there, uh, which is really kind of important in the beginning of the Romantic era, this interest in faraway exotic locations. But what's going to happen is once his army is in Egypt, uh, Admiral Nelson, the nemesis of the French, will des destroy a French fleet and he's uh, marooned there for a while. He will come back, however, by himself. He'll leave his army behind so to get ready for the uh, a crew that he will establish in 1799. Here's, uh, these are some great romantic paintings from the 19th century showing Napoleon. Uh, this one's great, the romantic hero. Notice far away exotic. You can tell it's romantic by the mosque in the back and the turbaned soldier. Probably the only really important thing that came out of this campaign, however, was uh, what the Rosetta Stone. Now, Napoleon brought with him not just soldiers, but also uh, what we call today archaeologists, and they wanted to study ancient Egyptian um, civilization. And in the half buried in the sand, they came across this tablet. Today it's in the British Museum. Some of you may have seen it if you've traveled to London. And you probably already know about the Rosetta Stone, but this is what made it possible for us to figure out Egyptian hieroglyphics. Uh, it's a, a tablet's in three different languages. One is ancient Egyptian, and one is in Greek, and that would be the, the key they needed to unravel the rest. Another great romantic painting. Uh, you might say they both are mysterious, Napoleon and the Sphinx. Okay, during this time period, um, and something you should be aware of and know, is, uh, and you can see how this ties in with American history so neatly. This is when France and the United States, the new United States, are going to come to blows over trade and the idea that uh, also France was uh, attacking American ships for trading with England. And uh, you know this from American history. John Adams sends over some diplomats and of course they're being bribed by Talleyrand. He's the gentleman on the right. It's known as the XYZ affair. <clears throat> and it's not our job to really go into this much depth, but to know that it occurred during this time. And this is an American cartoon that depicts the five-headed monster represented directory, which you know about, that ruled France in 1797, demanding payment of a bribe from the three American representatives. Okay, after that lull, we have another war. Once again, everyone's kind of had a chance to uh, refresh their forces. This is the second coalition. And notice where, what government is this? 1798, what happens in 1799, and then we're into 1801. <clears throat> once again, the only thing you need to know about this is, once again, Austria's defeated by Napoleon. And once again, as they threaten Vienna, there'll be a peace treaty. This is the only time, too, that England and France will be at peace. Notice that Britain signs the Peace of Amiens with France, 1802. It's just a timeout, remember, but it's the only time during the Napoleonic Wars, um, 1799 to 1815, when they will be at peace. Okay. 
Um, and once again, this, these kind of uh, camp pictures were very popular during the 19th century, showing uh, you know military victories and so forth. Okay. This is a great um, romantic painting by David, showing Napoleon crossing the Alps, going into Italy again, northern Italy, where he'll lead an army to victory. Um, obviously, he didn't really cross the Alps on a horse. It would have been too, diffi too difficult. He crossed it on a mule, but whoever heard of a romantic painting with a hero on a mule? So here he is, crossing the Alps, rearing horse. If you look carefully at the rocks, you'll notice the name of other um, potential conquerors and, and famous generals who also accomplished this. One being, of course, you guessed it, Hannibal. Okay, during this peace interim, um, the only thing I really want you to take a note of is Napoleon attempts to reconquer Haiti. And this is an important event in American history, of course. Um, we think he was thinking of an American empire, and Haiti was going to be his staging ground where he would um, be able to have his army supplied and from there move into Louisiana territory. But um, you should have studied the world history. Um, Toussaint Louverture, the Black Napoleon, who had freed his people from the French. And so a French army under General Leclerc goes to Haiti to try to bring uh, the island under French control. But it's a disaster. Between the guerrilla warfare that's going on and malaria, the French army, including General Leclerc, are wiped out. And of course, Napoleon decides to just cut his losses. And this sets up that great event in American history. Um, the United States, under Tom Jefferson, realizes that they need uh, New Orleans. And of course, um, for, to get money for his wars, Napoleon throws in uh, a great deal. How about the rest of it for $15 million? So, um, so you should know the significance of Haiti, which leads in many ways to the Louisiana Purchase. The other thing I want you to take note of here is the significance of the number of states in the Holy Roman Empire are reduced. And this is due to what I mentioned earlier, uh, the uh, disgrace of the princes. As, as the French armies freed um, the Rhineland, they told the German princes there that they could get land from their fellow uh, Germans east of the Rhine River. So what the um, major German states did was simply take over their smaller neighbors. Uh, so what states benefited from this land grab were obviously the larger ones, like, such as Saxony and uh, Württemberg and Bavaria. The problem, and this is also something I do want you to take note of and take notes on, is many of these newly enlarged German states now depended on who for their survival in their current large size, and that, of course, is Napoleon. Uh, he allowed this to take place. It's also an important event in German history because what's happening is the number of German states, remember there were over 200 of them in 1648, are slowly being reduced okay, as the larger ones take over the smaller ones. And this is a key event in the eventual unification of Germany. And there's a great map of the Louisiana Purchase. And you can see how much land that we took. Um, and this would not have been possible probably, at least in this form, without Napoleon and his need for money and the disaster in Haiti. Okay, at this time, a year later, of course, he declares himself Emperor of France. And this is a great David painting showing, by the way, they brought the Pope from Italy. This is, they did this before they put him in jail. And uh, here he is um, at making this coronation uh, valid in the eyes of the Catholic Church, at least. Uh, Napoleon, of course, takes the crown from the Pope and puts it on his own head, and then takes the crown and puts it on his wife's head, Josephine. And uh, it's a uh, another propaganda poster of the new emperor. There's a close-up of that picture. And Josephine. A lot of novels have been written about their love affair. Um, it's a very turbulent marriage, and uh, we can talk more about that in class. Uh, she was previously married. She was born in Martinique. Her home is still open to visitors. And um, she ne never was able to give Napoleon a child. And that's one reason why the marriage will be dissolved later, besides the constant uh, womanizing of Napoleon. Um, one thing in the, in the corner here is a close, by the way, you can see how large this painting is. It's huge, and uh, it's neat to show people standing next to it to get a, a sense for just how big it is. Here's a man you want to keep your eyes on. Um, there's not a lot of names you need to know in this unit, but Talleyrand is one of them. He will be um, uh, the, the cat with nine lives, as I said in class. He starts off as a Catholic priest, uh, takes the pledge to the civil constitution of the clergy, becomes a key um, bureaucrat for Napoleon, later in charge of foreign policy. After the Russian invasion, he decides to change sides and becomes a spy for the English. Uh, after Napoleon's defeated, he starts to work for the Bourbons again, and he'll be in power up to 1830, always on the winning side. 
Last key propaganda picture is this in Napoleon, of course, by David. Uh, what goes around comes around, as they say. The French Revolution started with a, a king and it ends with an emperor. And there's a close-up of Talleyrand. Uh, he'll be on your body parts list uh, because of a lame foot. We'll talk about that later, too. Here's another picture of him as a bishop. By the way, his home, he became very rich, of course, today is the U.S. Embassy. And here's a picture of the U.S. Embassy. Um, you can tell it's after 9-11, see the barriers in front of it, and uh, so that's kind of cool. That's where Talleyrand lived. Okay, now it's time for another war, the Third Coalition, and this is France versus Russia, Austria, and Britain. Um, it's, it started over Britain's refusal to evac um, evacuate Malta, but you could tell, you know, war was going to break out eventually. I want you to pay attention to this. One of the reasons Napoleon will lose is the fact that the British Navy has a lot to do with it, but also their money. They were paying Russia 1,250,000 um, basically rubles for each 100,000 soldiers they put into the field. So basically this allowed Russia to fight. And uh, we've talked about the, the idea of a national debt and national bank is making a big difference. Um, meanwhile, Napoleon's getting ready to invade the channel, uh, to cross the channel to invade England. Now, this happens all the time. He has the best army in Europe. If he can get across that channel, no one really doubts that he could have crushed the English. The problem is it's water. And to make this uh, even more of a problem, uh, this is one of the key battles you do need to know, and you need to know the significance of the Battle of Trafalgar, October 21st, 1805. And of course, this is where Nelson finds the French slash Spanish fleet off the coast of, um, as you can see, um, actually Gibraltar, and they destroy that fleet. And this is very significant because it means Napoleon will never be able to defeat England militarily. And he's going to have to come up with another way. Okay, meanwhile, um, so that army that was supposed to invade England now moves east as Austria and Russia together start to pull an army and move into uh, Central Europe. By the way, there's, uh, you can see where Trafalgar is on this map. And there's tons of uh, historical paintings that show this key battle. Lord Nelson, of course, is another name you should know. He is probably the greatest admiral in English history. Um, he noticed he lost an arm in an earlier campaign, and um, because of this victory, some of you who have been to England know about Trafalgar Square. He's the character on top of the square, which is sort of like central to Europe. The dream of every admiral in the days of sail was to cross the T. That means that you could bring your fleet, and the British fleet is on the right, see, in this kind of crescent formation, cross the T, meaning to cross in front of the enemy fleet, and you have the whole side of your ship to unload your cannons. Notice the Spanish-French fleet can't use most of their cannons because they're not pointing in that direction. This is a very difficult maneuver to do in the day of sail, but Nelson pulled it off dramatically. Unfortunately, he dies in that battle and never got to really enjoy the, uh, the, the benefits. Okay? Uh, if you've been on board the USS Constitution, this will look very similar. You can see why um, this, the casualties were so heavy, because what usually killed soldier, uh, sailors was the shards of wood as cannonballs decimated these decks and the walls, and of course these, um, this, these wood splits would be flying around, and, and that's what uh, killed most of the people, not necessarily the actual gunshots. Um, there's another one of these classic paintings of the Battle of Trafalgar. Meanwhile, in this coalition, Napoleon, on the other hand, also gains his greatest victory. The Battle of Austerlitz is considered to be one of his masterpieces, where he destroys an Aust uh, Austrian and Russian army. Uh, and, the, and the novel War and Peace is a whole chapter of this, on this battle. And Napoleon uh, very often had this kind of macabre habit of going over the battle afterwards, death and dying everywhere, and soldiers brutally wounded. And you just go through the battlefield, kind of just taking in all this stuff in a very kind of morbid way. And it's described pretty well by Tolstoy in War and Peace. But you do need to know this battle as well. The Russians retreated. They did not surrender. But it does cause Austria to sue for peace. OK. Uh, please, please, uh, pay attention, OK? Don't put Beaker, um, you know, don't light him up again, please. He's already been electrocuted once. OK, back to business. 1806, Confederation of the Rhine. Notice after this victory, he finally just dissolves the Holy Roman Empire. He just basically says, hey, kicks the whole rotten structure down, and who's going to say no? And what he does is creates this buffer zone called Middle Germany, okay, or actually officially the Confederation of the Rhine, and you should know that. And you can see it's made up of these states. 
and they are now allies to Napoleon. So every time the French army goes into battle, it's not really the French army anymore. It's made up of Italians, made up of Germans, of the various peoples that he conquers. Okay. Um, now, obviously, what country is going to be really upset with this is going to be Prussia. Now, last time we talked about the Prussian army, they're living on their dreams of grandeur of the days of Frederick the Great. But their army had become rather stagnant. It hadn't really changed from the times. We've talked about how the French, using the levee of masse and nationalism, had created an army of um, really highly spirited soldiers, which we really haven't seen that much in Europe. And in this coalition, um, one of the key battles is Jena and Auerstadt, a key dual battle in which, once again, Napoleon totally defeats an army, uh, destroys the Prussian army, and uh, you know, using his cavalry, kind of just follows them and destroys them. And this is a low point in uh, German military history. But out of this will come a very important, significant thing. It's like a wake-up call. The Catholic being so humiliated like this, you're going to start to see, and we'll talk about this in class later, the development of German nationalism and also the, the re, um, reinvention of a German army uh, more similar to Napoleon's. This is one of the uh, ways, uh, indirect ways, that Napoleon changed Europe. His enemies are going to start to learn from him, and his victories are going to become a little more difficult to achieve. Okay. There it is. There's another one of those uh, propaganda posters, and you can see the, the French soldiers with their bearskin hats. This would be his elite old guard. Well, he has to follow the French army, uh, the Russian army, excuse me, and so as they're retreating towards uh, their own country, a key battle of Valau is fought at, almost in the winter. In fact, it was winter. And this was a draw, actually. It was a brutal, brutal battle, and it was undecided. So he had to wait for spring, and then in June 1807, he defeats the, Ger the Russians at the Battle of Friedland. And this is, of course, what caused, wait, excuse me, uh, Miss Piggy, please. This is not the time for that. Um, Russia is defeated at the Battle of Friedland, and this is what causes the Tsar, Alexander I, who is the grandson of Catherine, uh, to sue for peace, to buy time, basically, because the next step, of course, would be a French invasion of Russia. And after the Battle of Friedland, the Russians aren't ready for this. Miss Piggy, told you. Okay, here we come to something you should know and take notes on, the Treaty of Tilsit. This is the peak of Napoleon's power, 1807. And um, once again, they, they meet on the middle of a raft on the Neva River. And this has been, uh, has been often portrayed in uh, many paintings as well, which I will show you. But here's a map. And here's Napoleon at his peak. Notice the Confederation of the Rhine. And you notice how large France is. And you see France that this large, that includes parts of Italy and the Low Countries and the part of the Balkans, you know, it's during Napoleon's reign. Okay. And he also creates the Grand Duchy of Warsaw. Uh, the Polish, Polish will be probably his most uh, reliable soldiers for the very simple reason that he puts them back on the map. Without Napoleon, there would be no Poland. So let's go back to the Treaty of Tilsit for a minute. Okay, number one, uh, the Duchy of Warsaw is established. Uh, two, uh, Russia agrees to the continental system. Now, the continental system we'll talk about in more detail. You've read about it, so it's not, I'm not going to mention it here. But uh, they're forced to uh, abide by that. Three, Prussia is reduced in size. And the last thing is that they have to accept Napoleon's dominance of Europe. And this is sweetened uh, when Napoleon tells the Tsar you know, that he wouldn't mind if he moves into Central Asia, especially moving towards India, and that would be where the Russian Empire would be. See how Europe looks. There's a picture of the two meeting on the raft in the middle of a the river. Um, they shook hands, they kissed, and it was as if they had long, been long lost brothers. Meanwhile, on both sides of the rivers, the armies are kind of celebrating and the officers are kind of going to partying together and so forth. There's another picture of the same thing. They're supposed to meet on the raft at the same time, but Napoleon was notorious for always cheating at games and didn't, you know, always never wanted to be like anyone else, so he decided to be there first. Uh, personally, I think I'd rather have the other person there waiting for me, but he decided it would be more prestigious to be there first. There's another map of Europe in 1812. Okay, okay so this is the height of Napoleonic Empire, 1807-1812. Pretty much where I'm going to end, but a couple minute, uh, last minute things. Organization and spread of Napoleonic Empire. Well, first of all, it's France. And you notice how large France is, we just talked about that. Then there's what we call dependent states. You can see them on the map. 
Okay, these are states that like the uh, Confederation of the Rhine that depend on him. Okay, they that's they're pretty good allies. And then there's allied states. These are states like Prussia and Austria that he defeats, and then he forces them to also fight on his side and supply him with troops. And you can argue that this is really not a good thing. How trustworthy are these troops? And occupational governments. Well, first of all, very often he would make his own family, his brothers, kings, for, for example. But um, what group of indi indigenous um, people would benefit, who would be willing to be collaborators, in other words, work with Napoleon, and tended to be mostly from the middle class, people who um, felt stymied and frustrated by the old regime, and wherever Napoleon went, he destroyed the estate system. Okay, everything we talked about the way Europe used to be before 1789, he destroys that, and he opens up avenues of, of, of advancement, of talent. He was into uh, merit, and so if you were a lawyer or a bureaucrat, this gave you an opportunity to really advance yourself in life. And so many of his collaborators actually maybe welcomed him, or at least took advantage of the situation to rise in power. That's very important to remember. Okay. There you can see the states under Napoleon's control, states that are allied with Napoleon, also the states that are against him. One last thing, uh, what makes a great commander? Great list here. Discipline, unity of command, able subordinates, speed and concentration of force, um, flanking attacks, defense, near photographic memory, incentives for bravery, and a certain amount of charisma. Um, he had all of these. His armies could move faster than other armies because of the way he uh, just organized them into various divisions and corps. They'd be spread out over a large area looked like they were scattered, but he knew how the, the, the uh, road network worked, so he could usually concentrate them at one point for battle faster than his opponents. Uh, he, he did have able subordinates, but the problem with this is they were able subordinates under him, but he was so dominant, they're not going to do so well when they have independent commands of their own. As I said, speed and concentration of force was key, and also flanking, meaning he would make believe he was coming in one direction and send a division or corps around to their flank and usually catch them in a trap. Near photographic memory, he would remember the names of individual soldiers. Now his armies are like numbering like 500,000 men, and he would go to a, a corporal in the ranks and say, I remember you from the battle of such and such. That's astonishing. I don't, not, not many people can do that. And of course, it really had a tremendous impact on them. And the soldiers also knew that through bravery, they could rise up and become officers themselves. The comment was that every soldier carried in their knapsack a marshal's baton. And finally, um, wherever he was in the battlefield, you usually hear the men cheer. Uh, long live Napoleon, viva Napoleon, long live the emperor. And uh, Wellington, his adversary, said that he could tell when Napoleon was on the battlefield by the cheers of the French soldiers and that Napoleon was worth 10,000 men in a battle. My favorite story about this was on a, uh, one particular battle, French soldiers were trying to take a hill and they were constantly being repulsed. Napoleon rides up and simply stares them in the eyes and says, man, I need that hill. Give me your lives. And of course, they go ahead and they get it. Not many generals can do that. In American history, there's few generals that had that kind of charisma. Uh, which ones come to mind that had that kind of hold on their men? Um, I can think of one or two in particular, and we can talk in class about um, who they are. Weaknesses, I think partly was as his armies got bigger and he relied on foreign troops, uh, obviously this could be a problem. And the other, of course, is what I call hubris, this kind of pride that got to the point where he didn't know where to stop. He thought that um, he was invincible. And uh, usually, hubris always occurs before a fall. Um, I mentioned before that he's, uh, he knew how to inspire his troops. And he's the first um, general or leader of a country to come up with the idea of medals. And of course, the Legion of Honor is the highest medal in the French army today. Remember, um, uh, this is something that he started. And here's a picture of him presenting the Legion of Honors to some veterans. Um, just one last FYI. What does the French army look like? Well. This is the French army of the 18th century. Notice the white uniforms, tricorn hat. Uh, mm. Once again, kind of similar. All the armies look this way. Uniforms were rather held to skelter. And all of a sudden, the, oh, around the turn of the century, 1800, you can see uniforms definitely change. Uh, this is a typical French uniform, the blue and white. Notice the uh, tall hats. That, that's also very different. This is the old guard. Once again, uh, the bearskin hats. They had the young guard and the old guard. The old guard were his old veterans. Some of these men now were in their 30s and 40s, kind of old for soldiers, but they were the most reliable. He knew he could count on them and never liked to put them in battle until the last moment. They were his reserve, 
or for a key attack to, to um, swing the balance of the battle into his favor. Okay. Also, just remind you as an FYI, he used a lot of foreign infantry, as I said. Okay. After 1806, about one third of the French army were foreign. By 1812, more than one half. The Poles, believing that Napoleon would reestablish Free Poland, were perhaps the best. The Swiss were well-trained mercenaries. Italians usually served well. Germans were variable. Um, so that's what they look. There it is. Uh, there's Napoleon's Polish Legion. Usually, obviously, you could tell them by their uniform, some difference in color and so forth. This should not surprise you. Um, the, anyone, um, the people who hate the English the most, of course, are the Irish. Uh, any war we study, the Irish will always be on the other side or sympathetic to the other side. And that even includes going to World War II. Um, and here's the Irish Legion. Raised from the almost endless stream of enthusiastic Irishmen that appeared any time there was an Englishman to be shot. Okay. So, um, one last campaign to mention, then we'll close this off, and then we'll have to do an activity in class talking about why does it all fall apart. The Fifth Coalition, 1809, was Austria decides to have one more attempt at breaking away from Napoleon's. Um, and so what, he, what happens is 1809, another battle, another war. And this time, it was a pretty close call. In other words, you can see that the Austrian army is improving. Napoleon won this campaign, but it wasn't as brilliant and not as easily won as the other. So it's a sign of things to come. But he does win. And out of this, of course, the, um, the Illyrian provinces were created by the Treaty of Schoenberg in 1809 when the Austrian defeat were defeated. Now notice where they're located. This is in the Balkans. And this has a tremendous impact because notice it's like in the sphere of influence, not only of Austria, and Ottoman Empire, but it seems like it's moving towards Russia. And this will be one of the things that will cause Russia to decide to, it's time to break with Napoleon and also get rid of the continental system. And of course, this is what's going to cause Napoleon to want to invade Russia, to teach them a lesson. So the significance of causing growing tension with Russia, okay, with Russia. Um, also in this, Napoleon needs an heir to the throne. So he divorces Josephine, and the Emperor of Austria's daughter is going to meet. Maria Louise will be the new bride of Napoleon. Uh, a lot younger than him, but out of this marriage will come a child, and so the child will be called the Prince of Rome. Rome was part of the French Empire at this point, so the second most important city, the Prince of Rome, will be Napoleon's son. We'll talk in class about what happens to him later. So, this is the end, and we're going to look in class tomorrow on the major reasons for the collapse of the Napoleonic Empire. All right? Thanks for listening, and once again, you have a copy of this. I'm going to put the PowerPoint on Edmodo for you, and your workbook also follows along with this. And so I hope I emphasized the important material for you. See you in class.